And I thought more and more about this as I saw more and more people throwing their hats in the ring. I said, Gen X is the one generation right now that literally is keeping their stuff together. Guys, welcome back to another episode of ATDC of House Off the Cuff. You know, your blog about learning and development, professional development, and everything we do to help people do their jobs better. And yes, we are still in this crisis of COVID 19. And I've got the guy that wrote the book, Gen X Code. And we're going to get into the whole detail of that book and the title and all of that. This guy is a professional, a learning professional. He's been doing training for a long time. Good friend of mine, know him, and very active on LinkedIn. His name is Jeff Wallner. Hey, Jeff. Welcome. Good to see you, my man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I really appreciate you coming around this time because, you know, with everything that's going on, a lot of people cancel or, you know, some people, I guess, can't handle being off the cuff. So, <laughs> by the way, we gotta we gotta keep our social distance, man. So we gotta at least uh, uh, true, uh, true. Feet over me, here, so. Yeah, <laughs> hold on, the other way. Yeah, right <laughs> is left, left is right. <laughs> so we're doing the blog, and also if you guys are listening on the podcast, that's basically what's happening. You can always catch us on YouTube, and if you want to do the podcast, make sure you go on Anchor and catch us there. But we're gonna talk about learning survival skills. Yeah, learning survival skills, not survival skills, but learning survival. As learning professionals, what happens here, you know, with this crisis. Um, if you are a training and facilitator, you know that your world changed and uh, most likely probably change in the future as well. So how did you prepare yourself? Some of us were really lucky that we were already living a digital life. Um, I'm going to claim that one. I've been doing this for a while and I haven't relied on being face to face, but obviously there's some value. There's amazing value to that. Jeff has been doing both for a long time and he's now refocusing. Um, Jeff, tell us a little about your background. What's going on with the business that you do and how long you've been doing it? Okay, my background. So um, at least my maternal side, about uh, 64 generations back, it comes down to- uh, <laughs> Okay, so yeah, been, let, let's break it down. No, but don't stop there. Make sure you do give me RNA and DNA. The whole thing, man, absolutely. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> what do you want? I take things- All right, smart guy, so, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> So I've been in the L&D world for a fairly long time, since uh, about 2002, when I started out leading field teams out in Michigan to do political organizing. And then I did that in D.C. I led more field teams like you and like so many other people just kind of fell bass backwards into training. And they just said, hey, you're the trainer now. Figure it out. And that, that, became, that became the thing that became my passion, honestly. You know, it's getting people up to speed and teaching them how to communicate for leadership and persuasion and effect. Awesome. So you're doing that under the, the banner of what, uh, Training with Wit or? Yeah, yeah. My company's called Winning Wit. So we're Winning a team of, uh, of trainers, speech writers, comedians, and we help take people's content and make it great. So whether it's a speech at a wedding or if you are a in-house trainer or an e-learner, whatever you are, and your content is boring and dry and puts people to sleep. I know that's never happened before, right? Not with your stuff. Um, I'm oh, sorry, what? Right. <laughs> so we basically, uh, yeah, we take your content and we make it interesting. We make it fun. We make it engaging. We make it something people want to enthusiastically digest. And that actually won't cause them to take thumbs after they digest. It's something they actually enjoy. Goes down easy, absorbs like, ah, okay, I got it. That was good. Mm. All right, man. So let's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. I mean, you usually do some great stuff. I know I was out there for uh, the chapters, uh, leaders conference. You ran that nice party up in their the rooftop and whatnot. So that was awesome. Um, but what happened here? Cause in a, in a matter of a couple of weeks, you just knocked out a book. Is that what happened? Yeah. You know, uh, so unlike you, I never fought in a kinetic war, but I do feel called, you know, to compete in this one, to throw my hat in the ring, to, to step up in some way in this fight. Just sitting at home on my couch, that's, that's just not going to do it for me. I'm not wired that way. So what I saw out in the airwaves and on LinkedIn and Facebook and everywhere else were people absolutely losing their minds over this. And I get it. it this oh, is, yeah. uh, it's an uncertain time, a lot of fear, anxiety. But I didn't see people approach this like a battle. I saw them approach this like an enemy that can't be stopped. And they're running under their beds and panicking and screaming. So I noticed this primarily coming from two generations, coming from the baby boomers and from the millennials but I didn't notice this coming from Gen X <laughs> and I'm looking around like, like guys like you and my other contemporaries, I'm looking around and say, you know, Gen X is not panicking. Gen X like, all right, 
this sucks, but we'll get through it. And that's it. And I thought more and more about this as I saw more and more people throwing their hats in the ring. He said, Gen X is the one generation right now that literally is keeping their stuff together. So what if I can channel that energy and actually write a book to give everybody a guide on how to use the Gen X kind of motto and ethos and approach to life to get themselves through this crisis? Hey, that's true. That's true. Hey, you got a good point there because I mean, I'll tell you some personal stories here. Like, for example, like I was thinking about this as well, because, you know, it's one of those things. I, I thank obviously my military training for being able to deal with crises and not freak out on things. Cause I mean, you, you're trying to do that and you do it. And it's, yeah. it, I can explain to you what is, it's not bragging to be tough. I mean, there's fear, there's always fear. Um, but it's a control element of it, right? It's like, you like, okay, I'm scared of scrap right now. What am I doing? What am I, what am I doing about it? Right. So <laughs> it's always that, what am I doing about it situation? Um, and then, you know, I, I had a benefit that before I joined the military, I also grew up in a third world country. So <laughs> I, you know, I had to worry about people stealing my shoes when I was 14. I had to, <laughs> I, I went through a siege situation in a, in a, in a government down there in South America. So, you know, I spent like two weeks locked up in a house, no internet, uh, with my dad just, and the only thing that was there was radio and maybe a couple of books and we played chess. I mean, so figure that out. And I was only 14. So <laughs> from that perspective, I see, I see stuff like this and it's like, okay, well, possibility that we can get sick. Okay. I'm locked up in a house. Nah, not really locked up in a house. I can go out and take a walk. Uh, I can go out and do things again. It's not really much different also than what I've been doing for the last two months, just working in the learning because I work from home. So, uh, and now I can understand people that were going to offices and now they can deal with that. And I know people personally that depend so much on that social connection, you know, and being able to talk to someone or hang out with people all the time that, you know, they, they definitely are, a couple with the anxiety there, you know, it's hurting. So great points there. I, I, you know, the Gen X people, I, I can see what you're talking about as well. I mean, when I put it on my wife's side, my wife, she lived things like going through the gas, you know, shortage situation back in the day in the seventies. So yeah, I get you I, at that point. So what are the key tenets of your book? What will be the interesting things that people need to look at? Sure. So it's two basic points that the book all kind of brings home. Number one, bad things happen in life and they don't just happen to us as individuals. We know that, but they happen globally and they've been happening globally since the beginning of time. So we need to orient our perspective toward that and realize we're not special. We're not immune from the human experience of having world wars and having pandemics and volcano explosions and a new Nickelback album. A lot of bad things happen in life, you know, micro learning, yep. micro learning, a lot of really bad things happen. The same thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but number two, and the most important point is that, yeah, while bad things do happen, we always, always, always get through it. Civilization and humanity is undefeated against pandemics. We are undefeated against world wars. We're undefeated against all this stuff. We have a 100% win percentage. Those are good I, odds, and that's the horse I'm backing. So we're the best cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take care of us that easily. Come on. Even the cockroach is like, yeah, these guys are pretty solid. <laughs> no, I, it's an interesting thought, right? What about if aliens were just flying off? <laughs> I'm out of here, man. I'm not dealing with aliens. Forget I usually, about it. I, just, <laughs> I usually think the aliens evade us because they look at the stuff we do and they're like, oh, no, we're not messing with those people. No, if, if aliens show up, man, I'm just going to, I'm going to pitch my services to them, honestly. I'm like, all right, I'm going to write a book about how to communicate with the earthlings. I'm going to MC your first event. We're going to, you know, we're going to make a time out of this thing. I'll, I'll be your guy. No, just send them a couple of instructional designers. They'll probably overcomplicate things for them. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, um, we're sending the Yankee stadium after about a couple hours there, they'd be like, no, nah, I'm out of here. Forget learning it. objectives. What is yeah, that? Nothing to do with this place. <laughs> this, these people know we got to go. All right, cool. So, all right. So you got the book and man, you wrote it in two weeks. So like you had a muse or something, right? Like big voice from the top came down to you. And just, yeah, honestly, it just kind of wrote itself. And I figured I have to do something in this fight. I have to contribute my sword on some level. And what do I do? I, I write. It's, it's my passion. It's, it's what I love. So I figured mm. um, I was able to find coping mechanisms to emotionally get myself through this. And I see a lot of people around me that are just kind of gripped in panic and anxiety. So if I could write something that can help them get through this too, I feel like I'm at least doing my small part in this, whatever part that may be. I feel like I have to do something. 
So yeah, great. That's tough. That's awesome. So the um, what about the learning survival skills? Then what 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 can we do? I mean, because I always thought that look, when you look at this, I always like to think also, and the thing that's always helped me is like to think, hey, look, it could always be worse, right? Mm-hmm. So like, if you're not learning, if you're not in New York, you could be in New York. Right. Yeah. And if you are in New York, well, you could be in Africa. There yeah. are just different. There's or Italy. Extenu- <laughs> yeah, Italy. <laughs> Extenuating circumstances and things that make everything worse. Um, and it could always be worse. Um, I actually thought for a minute, you know, you've seen, you remember the movie uh, World War Z? I mean, it could actually, we could, it, what happens if we ever hit a point where <laughs> we get one of these viruses that turn people into violent <laughs> zombies? I mean, <laughs> It's, you were in the freaky moment. <laughs> perspective is important too, because I, you know, this is bad. And I'm, you know, neither one of us are downplaying this, but on the other hand, perspective is really important too, because yeah. this could be Ebola. Could you imagine if this were Ebola with this level of contagion? Oh, of course. Yeah. No, I mean, no, Ebola no. had a fatality rate of like out, 60%. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it could always be worse for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it, that situation broke out. Like I was saying, the world war, uh, Zombies, you know, this, the war uh, the zombies being attacking, attacking zombies and stuff like that. I would just say, you know, just, just throw on compliance training with the multiple choice quiz. And that's all it'll take. Today. That's all it will take. They were bored to death. They'll just commit so, Hari Kari, like on a massive scale. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's get back to the grid then here. Um, so main things, man, I think what happened with a lot of people is like, look, you, first of all, you got to work from home. I seen a lot of posts on LinkedIn where people are saying, Hey, you know, I got kids. This is not fun, especially, you know, different ages. I can feel it uh, for sure. My kids are already teenagers, so I can, you know, logically tell them, Hey, uh, keep it down. Bye-bye. Do something else. (laughs) But when you got like five, six year olds or threes, terrible twos, man, I'm feeling for them. Tough stuff. Brutal and absolutely brutal. And, um, so I don't have any kids, you know, that I know of full disclosure. So, I can't give any advice on that, but, but one thing that has helped a lot of friends of mine who do have kids and family members who do have kids is to try to compartmentalize the day. You know, it's accepting there's going to be some chaos at some point during the day and not getting rattled, like building the chaos. Like, all right, it's 10 to 12. Haven't had chaos yet. Definitely coming at one. And if not 100% coming at three. So you got to like steal yourself for that. And there it comes. Like, ah, there's a wave of chaos. There it is. Yeah. There's my warm blanket of my insane three-year-old running around and punching the wall and writing magic mark around my face and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then I also say like, you know, use the technologies. I mean, you know, one of the greatest things I use raising the kids is the automated, what I call the automated childcare assistance, you know, get on my video game console, tablets with games, you know, they'll be there for hours, not bothering you. Absolutely. <laughs> Now don't make it a, don't make it a norm, but I mean, there's something that's a good remedy if you need to get a meeting going or if you need to get a virtual meeting going or whatnot. Cheaper than childcare. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a lot of uh, a lot of popularity going on with the with the apps like we're using here, like Zoom and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, getting acquainted with that. So, what do you think are the benefits of this crisis? I mean, what what are the great things that come out of this? I think there's going to be a lot of great industry. things. Yeah, in this industry, 100. First of all, I just like every other industry, the appreciation that remote work does not mean screwing off. It means actual work. And in fact, better work and more work in most cases. Um, It also shows that virtual learning does work. But I think another one of the tertiary benefits is going to be a deeper appreciation for in-person learning. I think there's going to be kind of a return to that in some ways, because they're as great as e-learning is and and as incredibly powerful as virtual learning can be, there is a component that you can't replicate that happens in a live classroom. So what I think there's going to be more of a blended learning approach. I think. And what, what is that? Cause the, here's where we're going to go off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, man. There's, there's an emotional contagion that happens when you can pick up someone's like kind of body heat and signature and body language and, and tone and style. And there's just something that happens. There's a magic that happens and okay. that can be replicated to some degree virtually, but there's always going to be that little extra level. Okay. That has to happen in person. And what's the value of that? The value of that is relationship building ultimately. Okay. Because that's really where you see people cement these lifelong relationships. That's why conferences have such important value. We, all conferences could be done virtually, but there's a reason they aren't. Right. And it's that human component to it. Yeah. It's, it's a good way. It, definitely. It's something to catch on there. I think the main thing that a lot of people, it's a good thing to, to have a conversation around, right? Because 
there's always this discussion, oh, well, the, you know, uh, face-to-face learning is so much better than e-learning because of uh, the content or the experience itself. And I think what's, what's more important is what you're talking about is the connection with other people and the ability to possibly have informal learning happen. Absolutely. So I don't think from a, an actual learning standpoint, there's a massive, massive gulf between the two. And you can right. do learning just as effectively virtually as you can in person. But that human touch, that element, that relationship building, that ability to truly connect with your fellow learners and with those who are instructing, I think that, that is invaluable. And that's something, honestly, I miss a lot these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it's, you know, absolutely. It's like, you know, if, if the opportunities to, you know, let's say sitting in the same room and I get to meet, you know, people like Clark Quinn, or I get to meet you, or I get to meet, you know, um, other folks like, uh, Kara North or, mm-hmm. you know, any other names out there, Aaron King, any other like that, that we get, you know, if not saying myself, but I'm saying just anyone can hang out with these folks and learn from what they've done. I mean, Carl Cop, all that stuff, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's the opportunities to be able to meet these folks when you go to conferences, learn from them and get, yeah. uh, a uh, uh, first person, basically a first person experience of that. I think that's very important. And when you're doing the ILT stuff, I mean, we call it ILT, but we really should stop calling it that. <laughs> I like more a uh, facilitator, f- facilitated learning discussion. <laughs> yeah, I love that. They're a learning group or something. <laughs> but uh, in any way, um, uh, yeah, everybody knows it for over, over 40 years, uh, ILT, but we know that we mean different things. Uh, Absolutely rather than the original meaning. So cool. So the, um, so we got this modification of things. And I mean, they're talking about this thing being seasonal, um, the virus, the the coronavirus, uh, being this new coronavirus, basically Mm -hmm. being seasonal, uh, meaning that it can come back in the fall and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So the outlook is, it's variant. Um, I mean, it's changing the industry regardless of the case. I think the good benefits, as you mentioned, technology is one thing. Being people not being so afraid of using technology and learning, what are some of the limitations that happen, you know, um, and 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 work out. But um, but yeah, I mean, in the end, um, it's it's all learning. Yeah, it is. It's all learning, and I think it's going to give us uh, more of an appreciation for what we had. And what we lost when it's all said and done, I think we'll appreciate classroom learning more. You know, how many times we've been there and people just, mm-hmm. just you know, knocking out now, but I think there'll be at least in the, in the near term. And I'm thinking, you know, kind of in the next, you know, six to eight months or so, this kind of euphoria, of we've got our lives back. <laughs> we've, you know what I mean? And like, I don't care if I have to sit through a boring classroom, I get to sit <laughs> in a classroom. So that'll be like yeah. an initial jolt. But you know, the interesting thing about it is a lot of people are talking about the long-term transformative effects of this whole situation. Mm-hmm. I'll be honest with you, man. I don't think long, long, long-term we're going to see that much of a change. I think we have an incredible ability to have a reversion to the mean as people and as a society. And, and the example I like to use for that is 9-11. Remember after 9-11, there was a feeling in the air that the world had changed permanently. We were never going to laugh or smile again. We were never going to feel safe again. We'd never be able to walk into a building or go to a high floor without feeling anxiety again, that, that everything had just changed forever. And there was that, remember that feeling in the air and you could, mm-hmm. you could cut it with a knife, that tension. And it was like that for a few months, but then over time, eventually, you know, minus the rub downs at the airport, everything really did get back to normal for the most part. And, and life just went right back to the way it was. And I think over time, we'll really just kind of revert back to the pre COVID world. And this is just going to be looked at really as kind of a really bad dream. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting take on that. Uh, being a, a, a bad dream. <laughs> we were like a collective class. bad dream. Like, did that yeah. really happen? I don't know. I thought it was hallucinating <laughs> for a few months, but that happened to you too. Yeah. 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 I think also that one of the biggest, the biggest challenges with this is not so much that, I mean, we're living it in, in the, you know, I always say, and I always will say best country in the world, right? So it's happening in the best country in the world to us uh, in the best living conditions, pretty much that we have around the world. And so, yeah, it's called a crisis. People are getting, you know, it's infectious, all that stuff. They have, many people have died, rest in peace. Many, many people are getting sick, but in the same instance, 
I'm able to, you know, I was able to more this morning, get up and go to the grocery store and buy, you know, $200 worth of groceries and I I feed my kids and everything's fine. So it's, uh, you know, it's an ambivalent situation there because yeah, there's still that looming problem. And obviously, you know, we get this daily updates and, and the barrage of information. So yeah. The barrages, it's, uh, and I, I talk about this in chapter two of the book about how basically the media is a clown show. The whole thing is just a big clown car. Yeah. And the purpose of a clown show is to get people eating cotton candy and popcorn and just like enthusiastically tuning in for more. So they're going to throw the craziest headline they can think of, the most shocking numbers they can think of every single day to outbid their competitors on shock values. So yep. I look at it like a clown is bursting through my door and I just laugh and I turn the page. Hey, what about all, my, all the amazing virtual learning experts that just came out of nowhere? <laughs> you know, Say, we were saying before everyone's a virtual learning expert now, and everyone's oh, yeah. an epidemiologist. <laughs> oh yeah, every every two weeks, yeah, two weeks ago, I was like, wow, boom! <laughs> you know, I was like, everyone's learning an experts everywhere. Expert. <laughs> yeah, virtual learning experts everywhere. Incredible. Amazing stuff. But anyway, I want to give people an appreciation. Yeah, yeah, I want to give a shout out to actually know folks that I know are good experts out there. Um, <laughs> let me see if I. Man, I can't recall any names now. That's great. Let me give a shout out to people I can't remember. Um, so, no, but I do have I do have a few folks in mind, uh, and and we, there have been here in, in episodes. So, um, I want to give a shout out to people who have done it all the time. They actually have done it. so. Joe Cook is one of them uh, from mm-hmm. England. Yeah. Uh, she's pretty cool. And then uh, <laughs> and then we have um, wh- who do you have? You have anybody you want to give a shout out to? Uh, just in the kind of the L and D world generally. Yeah. They've been doing virtual, you know, the, you knew as virtual learning experts before we went to, you know, this crisis when now everybody's a virtual. Well, learning the, yeah. There's one person I have in mind. I, I'm a little reluctant to give him a shout out. Cause I want to give him a big head. He's down in Florida. His name is Alex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, <laughs> literally you can't give me a bigger head than what I have. So, <laughs> so, Let's do that. But I'm going to tell you what right now here, because I got my hot list. Okay. So here we go. The person that I'm talking about is Cassie Labori. There we go. Man. Yeah. Okay. I've seen her Ooh. stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when we're talking about Cassie, it's not like, you know, you know, I'm not saying that she's like a super technical hero expert. Out there. What I'm talking about is Cassie has a lot of creative stuff when it comes to virtual facilitation and actually engaging people in this, because the main thing on virtual facilitation is that, people tend to treat it as a webinar, right? So a webinar is just passive stuff. People sitting there and some, somebody just dumping content on you. So, and then people not paying attention. So I like the, what she's done with a lot of the interactivity and stuff like that. And there's a couple of books that she wrote about on this. So may, definitely check it out. Links in the comments. So that was a shout out. <laughs> I love that. I'm glad that we got to that. <laughs> so, Hey man. So Jeff, you know, you are awesome for coming on the episode here. I really want to thank you and thanks. Let's do some last, last thoughts, last words you want to give out there to the learning professionals on this whole situation as we're going forward. We're now April, April 2nd, April 2nd. So I'll share some good news with everybody and I'll share some perspective. And, and I hope anybody who feels a little disoriented or off their kilter or untethered from reality right now can, can kind of come back to a nice zone right here and we can move forward. So first and foremost, it's April and it's not March anymore. And that's, that's not nothing. March felt like it took 300 years to get through. And because it's April, that means we're one month closer to this thing being over than we were in March. So that's good news. On that note too, there is some good data that is emerging right now from China and some other places that the more UV exposure this thing gets, the more it degrades and dies and the less transmissible it is. So the longer the days get, the less transmissible. So we will see case counts starting to come down. And at the end of the day, the world continues to spin. Incredibly enough, the earth doesn't actually know this is going on. So it's still doing this thing and it's still moving and it's still going around the sun. And when this comes and goes, it's still going to continue doing that. We're still going to have an industry. There will still be a need for people who do what we do. There will be a tomorrow. So whatever it feels like today is lasting forever. Never forget there will be a tomorrow. Think about that tomorrow, plan for that tomorrow, live in that tomorrow. All right. Awesome. A nice uh, golden, golden nugget drop there for everybody. Uh, Jeff, I want to thank you again. Guys, this has been an awesome episode of ATDCFOs Off the Cuff, and we'll see you, and you can listen to us on the next one.